Hello, everyone. As if we didn't Hi. say this already. Hi. Um, not awkward at all. This is over its first in-person event since the pandemic, and we couldn't be more excited to have all of you here with us today. Let's just give ourselves a round of applause. Right? For being here in person and being awesome. Um, I'm Liam Ricuti. I am over its public relations account executive here. It's my job to get all of our clients in the news every day as much as humanly possible. Um, I come from a long background in television production. And for about 10 of those years, I was working in local news. Uh, but enough about me. Y'all rent the uh, event description. Um, we are talking about COVID, right? Uh, we're all here today um, to talk about the ways that organizations and companies have had to shift, adapt, to a new way of hosting events, to a new way of doing things. We've been saying that since this all started, you know, when we all thought that this was going to just be like a two week thing, right? And now it's become the new normal, like we were all predicting. Um, you know, th this, we're, we're talking about anything from press conferences, events, brunches, um, and larger events, events like this. What do you even call this? It's not a webinar. It's, not totally in person, it's a hybrid of some nature. Thankfully, not Dr. Wu's hybrids, um, but somewhere in between. Um, we're accepting ideas um, for names in our suggestion box in the back. Um, the pandemic uh, laid a lot of groundwork uh, for the webinar series. As you know, we've made a computer star out of our very own Paul Fahey, who's hosted about 40 webinars in the past 28 months. But what happens when we want to gather in person? How do we manage the, the crowd when people still have varying comfort levels? And how do you feed them? So we'll get to all of that and more, but first let me introduce our panelists. Sitting next to me is Liska Wilson. Hi, Liska. <laughs> Liska is known for building businesses and producing exceptional events. She comes with over a decade of knowledge and practice in entrepreneurship strategic planning, event production, running small businesses and non-for-profits, corporate marketing and PR, project management, building teams, and a wealth of other business and professional development areas. I'll let Liska talk a little bit more about what she does and how the last couple of years have really kind of shifted and changed a lot of your projects. Okay, so my little opening covers a, a wide range of things, but I would definitely say that event production is one of the big things I do, but it's usually in support of other things. Some of those things include economic development, business development, um, leadership training programs for whether it's women of color, um, college students or what have you. So I'm very much into programming and events and like logistical things with that splash of creativity. Um, but events is really one of the things I'm most passionate about. When I started my career, that was really the thing that was like, I'm gonna, whatever I'm doing, it needs to end up with event planning. Um, so that's kind of where my background is. So I've been doing event planning for over 10 years in a whole bunch of um, different capacities. But I would say that what people might recognize my events from is number one, um, Stiletto Brunch is an annual event that my organization, She's a Boss, produces every year. So that has been like the main uh, COVID impact for the things that I do. While we have also done like other smaller events um, that aren't as big as brunch, which is over a hundred people, um, brunch was the main thing that was still going at that time. So when the, the pandemic hit, it was very much, all right, y'all, this is what people are expecting from us. <laughs> what, what is our, what is our next step? And it, I think it, the COVID announcement with when all the regulation things started coming out was maybe around like, March was like springtime. Yeah. And that's like the very beginning of our planning season mm -hmm. um, for brunch. So we were just kind of like, yep, it'll blow over, it'll blow over. So we're like planning um, as usual, but really started hitting some challenges as we got closer and it's like, okay, we don't think things are gonna change. So we have to start rethinking audience size. And it really, what the biggest 
I think hit for me was the year before 2019 um, was our most successful one. And we were expecting to continue the growth and have like this big boom. And then it was like, not kind gonna happen. Yeah. <laughs> right. So we're like, we have to really figure out how to handle audience and food is also a big part of it. So it was really looking at every piece of the event. And of course, there's, you know, there's a challenge in, in each one and make sure the event is going to still be relevant. Like people are thinking about all these other things. So like, are people even going to care to show yeah. up, whether it's in person or virtual? So it was a lot of different things that we had to um, figure out as a team and a lot of new territory that we had to figure out. But we were really determined to still push through on it because, again, it was something people were expecting from us. And we just really, and I feel like we have to prove a point, but we're just like, we can make this happen. We saw everybody else canceling, but we're like, we're not going to be one of them. <laughs> so that was a part of the motivation to make sure that we found solutions to, to some of the issues we're facing. And we'll get to some of those solutions mm -hmm. in a minute because some of them were really interesting. Um, but um, next, I wanted to introduce Adam. Hello, Adam. Good morning. Um, Adam is the Director of Studio Operations here at Over at Studios. Um, for 15 years, Adam has worked with some of the world's most recognizable brands, actors, and musicians in some of the most prestigious venues across the country. In addition to post-production work, he's also involved in a variety of live events, including entertainment events like the MTV Video Music Awards, sporting broadcasts, and more. Do you want to give a little bit about how your uh, COVID experience has been with some of these events? Sure. Yeah. So my background is mostly in tech and production, um, not on the planning side, um, but usually the two work, you know, together, mm -hmm. ideally, right? Right. <laughs> in the best, right. best circumstances. Um, <laughs> But uh, working it over at a digital marketing agency when we're putting on these sorts of things, um, I've been trying to marry the technology with sort of like the user experience, you know, um, what an audience wants to see and what that even um, has to be when you're considering shaking up an entire thing, like what an event used to be. So when I think about like what hybrid is, you know, like th there's a couple different events, right? Like there's a live event, like we're in this room, like forgetting the streaming for a moment, a live event would be an audience and a presenter in the same room. And then you think about a remote event and it's a remote presentation and everyone consuming that presentation is also in a separate location. So everyone is remote. Hybrid to me is people in a room like we are together. Uh, there's an audience right here with the presentation. There's an audience outside remotely, but also like the presentation and the entire thing has to be a give and take. So whether that's questions coming from outside the room to inside the room, whether it's presenter coming from outside the room to inside the room and vice versa. It's really the engagement to me mm -hmm. and the integration of both of those scenarios that makes a, a real hybrid event. To that point, um, we needed to shift at the last minute with today's event um, as we I got that fateful message from Becky yesterday mm -hmm. saying that she had been um, exposed to COVID. So out of an abundance of caution, she is joining us virtually today, which is the whole point of this discussion, right? Um, so there's Becky, there she is. Uh, she, Becky is the Director of Community Engagement at Capcom Federal Credit Union. She leads the community relations team overseeing the Capcom Cares Foundation, public relations, and school and youth initiatives. Uh, she's also active with many nonprofits, including serving on the Board of Trustees for the Foundation for Ellis Medicine and the Board of Directors for the Schenectady City School District Education Foundation. She's a member of the Junior League of Albany as well. Thank you for joining us, Becky. I don't know where to look so <laughs> to not be weird. Um, but if you want to um, provide a little bit of information for our audience about, you know, kind of the challenges that you experienced in your role um, with the pandemic and planning events. Oh, we can't oh. hear her. Hold on back. One sec. It's all part of the show, guys. <laughs> all part of the show. Awesome. There, we go. there she is. Well, and I figured, you know, I wasn't trying to do this, but it, it actually worked out to be a perfect example of why you're hosting this event. So thank you. And to be clear, I'm not sick, just abundance of caution. I've been testing, uh, but just wanted to make sure, you know, I wasn't furthering any spread. But thank you again so much for having me and for the last minute pivot. Um, as some of you might know, I actually started my job in the midst of the pandemic. I began um, in my role at Capcom in July of 2020. Um, and, you know, I 
big, I love events. Capcom loves events. We uh, have some events that we put on ourselves. We also, you know, having a foundation and being a funder, we sponsor a lot of community events that nonprofits put on. Um, and what some folks might not know, but I also have a side hustle where I plan events as well. Uh, Micropolitan Matchmakers, my co-founder and I, we help singles in the capital region meet in real life. And so, so much of my life is surrounded by events. And from whatever hat I'm wearing, whether it's as a board member of a nonprofit, my Capcom hat, my micro Micropolitan Matchmakers hat, what COVID really forced us to do when it came to events was consider the purpose behind everything. Why are we here? What is the event? And I think that really helped shape what we were going to do moving forward. Um, one of the Capcom Cares Foundation's biggest event is a golf tournament. Obviously, that's a fundraiser, but people really always did love coming to that, getting together and networking. So for that first year, we still wanted to raise the money. We did a golfing alone together activity where we could bring in some money. Folks could still go safely in a smaller group connect network um, and it still spread awareness of what we were doing with our foundation um, you know with the dating business we want people to connect well it's really hard in the midst of that really kind of scary part of the pandemic to come together you know even mask mandates is things were starting to loosen up. If you're trying to get to know someone and get to meet someone, um, you know, we switched to a lot of virtual events where people could be face-to-face -face and have those conversations. Um, you know, in terms of sponsoring events, we would often have a conversation with the folks that are planning the events and saying, what makes more sense? Is there something else where we could give you the money? You skip the plate at dinner and it can go directly to your programming, you know, what works best. So I think really considering the purpose behind each event um, and making sure that you are hitting that mission uh, and then being flexible to figure out what that what that looks like. So uh, that's in a nutshell, I think, how COVID uh, sort of hit all of the different hats that I wear in terms of events. Thank you, Becky. Um, so first, I mean, when we're talking about that fateful day on Friday, March 13th, when our at least over its offices closed, um, it really kind of, you know, shot everybody uh, into technology, right? But there seems to be this generational shift um, regarding technology. I mean, I still have to talk my mom through how to toggle between a phone call and viewing the picture that I just texted her. So, you know, there's, there's still this, um, this shift. And, and so what have you seen, um, you know, in, in doing what you do, how to reach all areas of people who would come to your events. How, how did you make that possible? Um, kind of sticking on that note of the generational differences. Um, still, we, you know, we still have to make it happen. Digital, like you said, is, is becoming more of a day-to-day -day norm for folks and people have to acclimate or not. Um, but to kind of make it more accessible, make it a little bit easier, we would try to be very detailed in like some of the instructions, like we're pulling screenshots, like we're doing like mini manuals, even, and it's just off of the, the abundance of caution of assuming that people right. don't know what they're doing. Like everybody- Because you never might. want to assume either. Right, mm -hmm. right, right. So everybody might very well know exactly what's going on, but it's still like, all right, oh, we need to invest this time to make sure that they know exactly where that button is. And even for, um, people who are very in tune with technology, sometimes, especially now with like Zoom, that's the most popular platform people people use, is it switches so much that by the time my little tutorial says you can hit mute down here, it has already shifted. <laughs> it's already moved. <laughs> yeah. So that's something to keep in mind, like how far in advance are we creating these, these supplements and is it going to change by the time you need to use it? So definitely being more detailed in our communications, being more detailed in our step-by-step, -step, but also having conversations with people who have attended our events before, like what do you need? Right. What do you need to, to feel comfortable? Some people just didn't want to be in person. Some people right. maybe just caught the um, back end of the event. Um, when we did it in, in 2020, we had it fully recorded. So some people didn't even want to bother with getting on, but they will still buy their tickets so they can um, go watch the playback and sure. get the digital materials. Yeah. So having uh, just multiple touch points and multiple ways for people to engage Whatever's with the conversation. For them. Exactly. Right. And just right. give them a few different options. Now, Adam, I know you work with a number of actors and talent and things like that, and I'm sure that age range um, spans quite extensively as well. What have you seen, you know, because I'm sure in the beginning, um, a lot of that was your recording was done virtually. Can you talk a little bit about that? And that really fancy word that you told me about like a little while ago, that's really cool. Fancy words. Yeah. Oh, 
I don't remember the fancy word. <laughs> Um, well, yeah, I mean, you know, um, th that's not um, too eventy, but the, you know, we used to do, well, we still do a lot of like voiceover and ADR in the studio, and um, that usually entailed a lot of people being here. So Zoom, you know, bring, basically what we did was we took a tool like Zoom, which is typically meant to connect point A to point B to be able to this conversation, and we started utilizing this tool in a way that wasn't necessarily intended, which is basically connecting a studio in Los Angeles or Chicago or Montreal, London, anywhere in the world. And now we've got all of these people, script supervisors, directors, et cetera, all convening as if they're here, but to recreate this dialogue for this film. So they're hearing a talent that's here and they're seeing a picture that's generated here, you know, a scene from a film. And that talent is working with that scene and everyone else is, is now involved in that session. So it's kind of taking a bit of technology and using it a little bit of a different way. Um, I will just, just to go back, as you were mentioning, just kind of, you know, those touch points, I, I just wanted Please. to touch back on what you were saying earlier is as far as like getting people to have an easy time mm -hmm. to find the event. Cause if there's any friction points, you know, that's the worst, right. To, right. to, to meet your goal. So one of the things that we have done is, you know, um, we have this conversation a lot, especially for like, if it's a webinar or a, a hybrid event. The, the question becomes, do you want to control the traffic and find a spot so you know all of your numbers and analytics and it makes it a little bit easier and you can control the look and basically have, again, all the control in this one spot? Or do you want to go a little more broad and just meet people where they are? So not everyone who's going to attend an event, even if they're in person, want to necessarily engage and be in the you know, thick of mm -hmm. it and ask the questions and dive in. They just want to sit back and watch. Right. So something mm -hmm. like a Facebook or YouTube right. works really well. So you can stream to multiple places at once. So whether it's Zoom, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, and you can do this all from single platforms. Now those people can still engage with a chat feature mm -hmm. or commenting, and that can all get funneled in with third-party programs. So you still have that engagement if they want it. But you know, again, it's if you if you want to open up the door and meet people where they are to remove that friction and give them another option. If they're not, you know, big on Zoom or, or whatever it is, chances are one of those things you right, hope yeah. will, will just make it a little bit easier for them to, yeah. to find a way and, and yeah. you know, and engage and, and still keep your numbers up, right. you know, which is ideal. Right. And Becky, I want to pose the same question to you, really just more or less like, did you experience that struggle of this generational shift in technology doing what you're doing? I'm sure, you know, even with your side hustle, as you're calling it with, matchmakers like you know obviously there anybody of any age is going to want to date right so so what did you find when doing that yeah and and i think keeping it as simple as possible and for those things that might have been a little more difficult i i would almost just say ditto to everything that liska mm -hmm. said um, in terms of being really detailed in the instruction um it, one of the things that I thought was really creative and interesting that I know we did at Ellis and the food bank has done some really cool things is um, for those folks that really tire um, and, and crave the connection that comes from an in-person event, um, having some type of element uh, where you could pick something up or interactive that people could bring home with them and experience while they were a part of that technology was really interesting. And I think, um, you know, the food bank did this really, really well with the chefs and vintners dinner um, where they had the meals prepared, ready to go. You went, you picked them up, they had videos so you could watch on your own time. It was really easy and you could try the food as you were experiencing the video. And it's certainly not quite the same as being in person, but it's still sort of, you, you had that connection. You had that ability to feel like you were a part of something and it brought the tech, it humanized the technology piece a little more. So I think that was another thing that um, many groups have adapted to and done some really creative things. I know um, when our merger with ZefQ was announced, there was an event where it brought employees together and there was a magician um, just as a chance for folks to connect in a safe way from home and still be a part of something. So I think there's um, definitely some pieces that you can bring to the table while still using technology because the, the generational piece of it isn't always having trouble with the technology. Sometimes it's just really craving human connection for people who are not digital natives and haven't grown up kind of connecting with people like this anyway. Um, so I think those, those interactive pieces are also really cool. And there's been some very creative work done locally to, to bring that into the mix. 
Um, so I want to talk uh, like a little bit more logistics with you. Um, I know this is kind of a big thing with you um, in doing what you're doing. And so like, you know, I, I know I advise my clients that if we're going to have a press conference and we want to have like refreshments, you know, I say prepackaged, mm -hmm. go prepackaged. So, you know, cause it's, I mean, press conference, you're a handshaking site, right? Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure that everybody stays safe in that way. What are some of the things that you've learned in the events that you've been planning? Um, and Becky, I'm going to go to you next <laughs> after this. So, um, you know, just to kind of, uh, you know, elaborate on that a little bit. Food is so important. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to start there. Food is so important. Like for, for brunch, um, I think part of what helped us um, navigate having to make so much pivots is that we already had a, a pretty good structure for, for the brunch. It was what, maybe our third one, I think, by the time the pandemic hit. So we had a pretty good formula, essentially, for, for the event. So we focus on like four main areas as we're going through our logistics of planning, which is um, environment, message, fashion, and food is, is a big one. I know for my audience, it might not be the same for everybody's audience, but food is huge for us. So from picking the right caterer to having the right menu is important. So at least when it comes to food, some of those considerations that we made is the first and foremost consideration. You have to look at the rules, right? You have to look at the regulations right. and what the law says. So we have to go with that. We definitely prefer to have the food as a display. Um, in our 2019 brunch, we had a, a huge, beautiful dessert display. And then the food was um, catered out um, table to table. So we couldn't do the dessert table anymore. So we missed that. Um, but what we were able to do is we were still able to work with, um, you mentioned prepackaged food. So for that 20, um, was it the 2020 brunch? We did have prepackaged um, like brunch boxes. We're calling them sure. brunch boxes. So, but we actually had uh, even a mix there. So we had the brunch boxes, but then we had some of the food um, out so we could still have some of it displayed. So we had gotcha. one or two items that were set up on display um, for people who, you know, were comfortable with, with taking sure. the food, taking food that way. But we did have it less of um, walking out and catering and the caterer for, for that particular piece of it. It was kind of coming out in shifts. Um, and even another, another consideration for that is we eat, we also recommended people arrive in waves so that everybody's not right okay. at the same time. So yeah. we literally have people, we we're telling people this time slot, this time slot, this time slot, so people can uh, arrive in shifts um, right. to be able to have that space to to actually arrive comfortably. Right. It's not a big crowd at the door because, you know, with events in person, there's that big bottleneck um, if everybody's arriving at the same time. So being considerate of, all right, y'all arrive in waves, the food is going to be already out and you can take it and shift to where you need to, to eat and feel comfortable. So for that year, we didn't even have it as a sit down. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't even have like the typical banquet tables for people to sit down. We didn't even have tables really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, we didn't even really have tables and it worked out really well. We did it at Pal and Schenectady for, for that one. And it actually worked with, um, with the pandemic because it was two floors. So we had the food downstairs so people can move around downstairs or if they wanted more space, they could go upstairs to, nice, yeah. to, to eat their food right so we just really tried to make sure there was enough room for people to spread out enough room for people to arrive and still have their six feet right. of six feet of space so right. those are some of like the major considerations that we had to make sure we met people where they were um now i know becky you and i were working together to try and plan um a capcom cares foundation event that um was supposed to happen what like the end of june i think was the idea end of May and it did happen at the end of June. Right. Probably. Okay. So that's what it was. So, oh my God, so much time has passed. So we were trying to, to put together um, a nice event um, for uh, some recipients of the Capcom Cares Foundation and talk a little bit about that, what, you know, kind of the, the struggles that we had there and how we ended up having to shift. Well, yeah. And I think um, it's interesting because now you know, we're in this very strange time with COVID where similar to today, you know, you, you, some people don't even know what to do or what or what's the proper thing if you have an exposure or you know and how does this work and so right at the two days before the event we our panelists were dropping we had people saying that you know similar to me today i i 
exposed. I don't want to come in case I do get sick. And, and what's the etiquette? What's the protocol? And, and how do you roll with it? And so what we decided at that point was to postpone. We felt like it was really important, again, looking at that purpose behind the event and why we wanted to have it. We wanted to do it so folks could connect and so we could thank them for the work that they're doing. And we did feel like for this one, it wasn't a huge event. We wanted it to be in person. Um, so we still did that week that it was supposed to happen. We did the press piece. Thank you, Leanne, for helping us with that. Um, and we we postponed in a month later. We did have the in-person event, um, but we scaled it way back. We took the media component out of it. We focused on just the luncheon. We went from a panel of speakers to one speaker, um, feeling like that would be a little bit, you know, if he goes down, hopefully at least he could join virtually like what I'm doing today, but it would be a little bit easier to coordinate. So thinking through really the schedule, the timing, um, but but that was one event where it felt very important to bring people together um, for that that personal connection. And so, um, you know, versus I've had conversations with a lot of nonprofit partners where they're actually for certain events not going back to the in person piece because that was not really the purpose of it. They could do a mission driven video and have people join and donate and they were actually making more money on some of their fundraisers after moving virtually than what they were doing in person with all the overhead of an event, which is not to say that events should go away completely but just again coming back to that purpose and and the why behind it and designing your event from there, I think is what uh, is the shift that I hope continues as we can, you know, come out of this and continue to navigate what it looks like now. Um, so Adam, you know, we, when we were, you know, kind of chatting before uh, this event, you know, you, you said something that really kind of like stuck with me and you said, we've always had the technology it just took a global event for us to reassess what we could do to keep going. And so I want you to elaborate a little bit on that because, uh, you know, the, the thing is, is that not everybody watching this right now has an Adam Claremont at their disposal to help do all of these things. So like what, what, you know, what are some kind of like tips that you could give other folks that are going through some of these similar things who want to have some of these hybrid events? Like what, what do we do? Yeah, so I mean, the, the tech can be overwhelming and just can be a non-starter for most people, I imagine, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, I do feel that for the most part, a lot of the technology we're using, it's been around for a while and we're just using it in a little bit different way. You know, I mean, I think that when your back is up against the wall, creative people just tend to get more creative and find mm -hmm. a solution. That's just why, that's why we're in this, like right. all those types of people, that's kind of where we thrive, right? So you know, if, if you can find, first of all, like, you know, what's the goal, you know, is the goal to convene together in person is the goal to just get whoever you can to listen and watch and interact in another way. Um, is it just to find some sort of exclusive event where people are local or is it really to broaden your numbers? Really? It starts there. What are you trying to do? Um, but as far as the technology goes, um, you know, if we're talking about a hybrid situation, you know, because I know a lot of what we've been speaking about has been like, how do we get people together in a space safely, right? But um, if we're talking about hybrid, we can't forget about the people on the other other side of the camera, you know, and you want to create an atmosphere that is just as engaging for them as it is for people in the room. So if you've got the music blasting in here and you've got the lights, it's got to be, you've got to be able to replicate that in some form so that there's a reason for them to be there rather right. than just being like a, you know, a fly in the wall. Sure. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's thinking about that two part um, system. And when you're talking about technology, there's clearly there's zoom, um, which is probably the easiest way forward. You know, you've got your webinar functions. Um, there's some other, you know, fun bells and whistles that zoom is bringing in. But if you want to maybe add some pizzazz to zoom, uh, there's a, a, a platform that I really like called mm hmm Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm, <laughs> yes, it's called mm -hmm. try and Google it. Uh, mm -hmm is basically like zoom with like, you know, it's got some extra like visual features that are really, really simple to use. So if you're familiar with like a tool like Canva, which a lot of people might be like a lot of like little easy design aspects, it's kind of like that where mm -hmm can allow you to have these stock images, stock, uh, themes and templates to add to your video to create some more branding 
Um, you know, you can customize your colors, you know, to put more of your own company brand colors in there. It also will allow you to integrate presentations in a more interesting way versus just everyone seeing Zoom with here's my mm -hmm. PowerPoint and my faces, you know, the shared thing, which we're all kind of maybe done over. with. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. totally over it. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> so mm -hmm, just it's it's reimagining <laughs> that aspect. But just again, just like you're in person, it just brings more of the personality in. So you can take something like mm hmm. And instead of using your Zoom camera, you use the mm-hmm in Zoom. Now you're integrating a couple of things. So it takes a little bit more savvy, but there's that. Um, and then there's another tool if you really need to get your analytics down, which these things are very important if you're trying to, you know, post mortem after an event, find out where your wins and losses were, who attended, try and get some sort of, you know, attribution, you know, as far as like where the money was spent and where the money was earned. Uh, there's platforms like um, Webinar Ninja and Webinar or, and Webinar Jam. Um, these can control everything from your your invites to your your entire campaign, uh, your um, your open responses, your email open responses, and it can integrate even further with other analytics tools, third party platforms. So there, you can sort of step up and step up if you don't have a team. There's tools out there that have these a little bit easier resources and things that are sort of built for this purpose. So you can, you know, one person team it and get a little bit farther to either present a little bit more interestingly, you know, and also get that information back without having a team of people. So, th so those are the kinds of things that have sort of always been there, but now they're being marketed to for sure. these events. Mm -hmm. You know, we've right. always been able to capitalize on analytics for email campaigns, right? So now that's sort of just like, all right, well, people need this. So we're just gonna make it a little bit easier for you you know, once they've seen the way that people reacted and started using right. the tech, which right. is great. That's what you want. Exactly, exactly. But I, I guess, so the, the bigger question is, you know, like when Capcom had to cancel their event, like what, what do you do when you can't afford to cancel? You know, you've got budgets to meet, partners to answer to. How, how, did, how do you shift to keep going? And I know we had talked a little bit about this ahead of mm -hmm. time. Can you expand a little bit on that? So really the tag on to what you were saying is really what we did. We shifted. We are not the experts in, in the tech side thing. So even though you have your budgets to maintain and you still want to put on this, this event, you, you have to get really uh, savvy with shifting things. So, okay, we have to cut back our audience um, attendee numbers, but that means we have a little bit more, we're saving some money on food and food is expensive. Yeah. So we're saving money on getting the food, which means now we have this money to put someplace else. Um, so what we did uh, for 2019 is, or 2020 rather, we actually, shifted those funds to work with um, a production company okay. to to film it for us and live stream for us because we were adamant about not just slapping up the laptop and um, trying to zoom from there because we had a full day of two like a keynote speaker two masterminds and a panel so we still had the full spread of the agenda and we're like well, if we put up that how are we gonna right make right. sure people know what's going on laptop. right so we uh, actually procured a, a production company to to live stream for us and we were like we want multiple cameras we want to do like some zoom ins and we want some <laughs> pins and uh, we make we we got what we wanted so That's we and, but to your point of how can you bring that in person experience to the remote world and right. those are some of those details that i think really make a difference to people like somebody's watching tv they're watching oprah for example they are expecting a certain level of quality and features when they're watching Oprah there they don't want to just see one angle of the stage right that would be really boring right so that was one of the reasons like we need multiple cameras we need you to have two people here we sure. need some people to zoom in and we need y'all to pan we want to make sure that this is a production yeah. and I don't know what um software they use but we did have integrate some of those features so it's not just the regular zoom screen we had uh, people's names coming across the bottom mm -hmm. we had our logo on there we had an intermission where we had a um custom um, affirmational talk, like the actual name of it escapes me, but it was like a guided meditation um, sure. that someone custom made for brunch. Um, so during the intermission, it was able to be released to our in-person audience and the um, at-home audience at the same time because we were 
playing it through that yeah. software where it, again it wasn't just the screen it was the actual description of the meditation it was the person who um created the meditation so it was almost like a cute little 15 minute infomercial That's awesome. um so people can really feel like they're a part of it and even in addition to that um while we weren't able to fully execute that piece of it. We're actually working um, with some partners this year to try and execute it this year, but we created something called a watch party experience. So people can purchase um, a set of tickets in this particular rendition. It was like this amount of money gets you 10 tickets, which gets you also will mail you the box of in-person materials. So you'll get the brunch folders right. with all the handouts right. in them for each of your 10 people. We'll get you a, a coupon code or some type of gift certificate to a local um, liquor store. So you can get your champagne for your mimosas because what is brunch without mimosas? <laughs> so really thinking about what are the ways that we can, you know, allow them to create a space. Right. Um, and still be engaged with with people. And a part of that is making sure the video quality is on point, is trying to bring right. some of those in-person elements to the remote audience, whether it's just sending out that brunch folder or if it's we had a separate page for the remote audience that they can download the the um the presentations during the event, there right, was some right. additional content on there as well, even for the digital folks, um, some exclusive content just for people who are digital. Um, so think about different ways to, they're still, get that yes, to get that involvement, yeah. get the engagement, get the details. Cause yeah. people come to in person because they want the details. Yeah. Cause as soon as one detail is off, people are up in arms in person. So if right. they're not in person, you know, people are still expecting it a lot of the same matters. things. Sure, you are. And, and um, the one thing that, um, cause you had mentioned you had like breakout groups mm -hmm. at one point. And then, so, so this was interesting because you had a breakout group and then you would have a sponsor sponsor the owl on the table so that virtual folks could still participate in the breakout group we're, right we're not quite there yet so everybody listening that's that's the idea that we uh, have okay. going that's an awesome idea that's the right? idea that yeah. we have so going sponsor, for this year's brunch right you buy the owl and then you can still have the right or if they the have breakout. an owl on hand like let us borrow your <laughs> owl that's costing you absolutely nothing and we will let them know like hey capcom mm -hmm. let us borrow three of their owls right uh for these tables but we're, that was, we're thinking about that as one of the solutions. Uh, think about that. With an owl. Yeah. Right. See, <laughs> as one of the solutions, we're like, how can we make the people at home be a part of these breakout tables? So that's one of right. the ideas that we're right. thinking. But we're also, as alternatively, we're thinking, how about we just have completely virtual um, tables, but then everybody reconvenes um, for the debrief. For the bigger piece. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. So, so we're thinking that, about different that ways. That actually brings me to another question. And Becky, you might have some insight on this. Is you know how how this uh, how the pandemic affected nonprofits. You touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, I volunteer with Capital Roots, and and we had to cancel almost all of our fundraiser and uh, fundraisers, but we completely shifted to online. And when we were talking, you know, ahead of this event, you were mentioning that that um, made a huge difference in in how that went. Can you expand a little on that? Absolutely, and it it really depends on again that purpose. I know I'm like a broken record saying it, but you can find ways to still bring about that connection. And so many of those ideas have been brought up on this panel already, but to, I mean, Liska, you just said it, food is expensive. And so, you know, when there's, and you think about the pace that so many people who are very active in the community were keeping prior to mm -hmm. the pandemic of, you know, you could go during certain times of the year to a fundraising event, a gala, a dinner, uh, you know, every night, a brunch every weekend. And as great and wonderful as all of these things are, it, it can be kind of exhausting. And so I think the other piece that nonprofits found is those who kind of jumped on board early and got creative and figured out those alternatives, those hybrid things, those things where folks could be interactive and have a piece of it at home, they started to realize that, they were actually making more money without having that in-person piece of it. Now, many of them have returned and, and you know, I do think that there is something to be said for that in the same room connection. But I think when we think about pace and timing and, you know, I know we're here to talk about events, but the other piece is, you know, meetings and volunteerism, talking about being on boards. I think um, this environment, learning how to use the tools and, and making that more prevalent as Adam was talking about, it's allowing more people, I think, to be involved with certain things. If you can have a meeting and not have to travel, you know, a half an hour each way to sit in a boardroom together mm -hmm. and you can, you know, 
come up with ideas and plans and events and strategic plan uh, in a Zoom room together, there's a, a lot less time spent on that travel piece too and, and allows more people to get involved. And, and I think the same goes for attendance as well. I know since um, being able to be virtually and to do more things virtually, it, it allows me actually to do more. Um, and so I try to look at it that way. And, and you know, you have to figure out what that balance is of an in-person energy vibe connection and kind of getting things done and being able to do things. So I think, uh, you know, to look at the plus side of a lot of it, where we've come has opened a ton of doors for opportunity to change things up, get more involved. And, um, and I think in some cases, as we talked about, kind of save money on some of those in-person pieces and, and figure out how we can be more creative and flexible. Um, so I know we're getting short on time, but I just wanted to share an anecdote from when Becky and I worked together when she was at Discover Schenectady. Um, and we, uh, we were doing virtual press conferences before it was hip to do that. Uh -huh. And so it was our first foray because we, we were trying to announce, I don't even remember the event that we were trying to announce. I think, was it summer night? I believe it was, it was, um, I think it was Music Haven. Cause I want to say, Haven. I think it was with Mona. Yeah, it was. Yeah. So, um, so we were trying to, to announce this big event and I mean, I'm in there an hour ahead of time and I'm drawing on the dry erase board behind where I had staged this press conference to happen, like palm trees, like that. I mean, we're pulling out my third grade artistry <laughs> here and, um, and we streamed this on Facebook live and, and it did really well. Like we got a really great response from it. And I think this was in fact, what was this 18 or 19? I think it was 19. I think, I think it was 19. Yeah. So it was just before, like just under a year before everything shut down and everybody's like, uh, okay, well, can we still do our press conference? Mm -hmm. You know, so they're asking me all these, you know, kind of logistical PR questions. And I'm like, yeah, I totally have done this before. You know, yeah, we can totally do this. And so we did. And, and the biggest um, shift from, for the, the PR component was we didn't have to invite any extra people you literally only needed to invite the people that were speaking because the folks at home never saw the guests anymore, right? So we would stream it on, on Facebook. We would get the TV cameras and the newspapers to come and you reduced your, your body count, right? So you wouldn't have as many um, exposures. So uh, from, a, from a PR standpoint, at least in my experience with my clients, I said, yeah, let's keep going. We have stuff to announce. We have stuff to talk about. We're still important. We're not going anywhere and we're still working. So, you know, we would keep trudging through um, and, and it ended up being great success. And I don't think we really started having additional guests at uh, PR events until like the last like three or four months, I think. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it's been a huge shift for everybody. Um, and I know we're running short on time, so I wanted to open it up to Q and a, um, and I just, uh, I didn't, are we getting online Q questions or no? Do we know that? Oh, okay. Are you watching on where? Well, first let me ask, does anyone There's a Q &A, Mike, people. in person have a question for any of our panelists? Anybody here? Don't be shy. There was a question I've been watching on LinkedIn and there was okay. a question that somebody had posed asking the panelists, what's your outlook for the next few months? virtual in person okay. uh, does that change with the change in weather and seasons a thousand percent changes with yeah. weather and season i think we had talked about this yeah, in the did. conversation before you do have to know your audience um, my audience is primarily black people people of color women and winter time is not the time for me to be <laughs> trying to say um <laughs> let's go outside <laughs> and do something so even before the pandemic we we're already um doing more virtual events um during like the winter and the colder months gotcha. so like zoom again it's already a platform that was that was in existence but i'll say what are these next few months what are we in we're in july plenty of time to do outside stuff y'all mm -hmm. um trying to do as much outside stuff as possible um i know we've already been looking into what can we do in the warmer months that's outside opposed to trying to be back inside and especially in the northeast like we only get but so many sure. warm days so really trying to utilize them to the fullest so i think people are still going to be expecting in-person events to be happening um over these next few months they're still going to be expecting something um at least in my network and sphere of like influence 
I haven't seen as many people as concerned with, is there a remote option or is this hybrid? So people aren't really asking. So I think you have to decide as an organization what you want to do sure. and be really good about communicating that. Mm -hmm. People, I think, are open to a variety of things right now. Yeah. Adam, I'll have you answer the same question. I'm a huge proponent of let those cameras capture it all and push it out there regardless of the situation, barring like things like exclusivity, you know, and trying to like get that like, mm -hmm. you know, high end, like, you know, yeah, you yeah, know yeah. the cool kids club kind of a thing. I mean, I think for most individuals, most entities, you're trying to get your numbers up, you're trying to expand your reach. So if you can put that out to even more people, I think you should get that camera up and just create that hybrid environment, especially just get used to having it because mm -hmm. there's certain situations where you're going to really need it. Right. But I think if you just get in, in, in the habit um, and get that experience where you're utilizing it, I think only good things will happen. So to me, I just think that it should just remain hybrid and just give that option out there. Yeah, I agree. Becky? Yeah. I I love that, Adam. And to piggyback on what you said, you know, I think um, on the fundraising side, if you can do that and make things more uh, accessible to a wider range of people, you think about someone who might not want to spend $150 on a ticket to a dinner, but who want to watch the presentation and connect mm -hmm. with your mission and might then donate $25. Uh, you know, you expand your reach, you expand your donor base at many different levels. So that's kind of on the fundraising side. And Liska, going back to what you said, uh, touche on all of it and you know you think about COVID aside even just the weather like if if we can figure out this hybrid piece of things especially during the winter and you know a snowstorm happens you could still figure out a way to maybe put on your event because I'm, I'm big on not wanting to go out in the cold either I'm totally with you on that so I think really you know moving forward the name of the game is flexibility so if you are planning event especially in the fall and winter months as things get colder as you know we start to see headlines of variants popping back up and what that's going to potentially look like um, you know working with your event planner if you are planning to do something that has an in-person element how can you be as flexible as possible so that if something, you know, on the more catastrophic side happens, a big outbreak, another shutdown, you can be flexible, you can figure out and, and kind of work around that. I know, um, you know, I have some relationships with some really great event planners at various venues who, you know, we talk about that from the very beginning. So having that plan be ready to go. If you are planning an in-person event and you don't have that, I would say you're you're doing it wrong. You have to figure out the backup, even if the backup is we're going to cancel and have it a month later, like what we did with infrastructure mm -hmm. um, with that celebration you were talking about. So flexibility is is so key. But if you can, as, as Adam was saying, it, figure out that hybrid element. It, I think it's that's really the piece where I think it, it could be a game changer and, and it, there's less catastrophic things that could happen if you're already planning to have that element in your event. Well said. Any other questions? Go for it. How do I spell? Oh, no. We got it for, for, <laughs> for our remote audience right? <laughs> so they can hear. Oh, just a quick question. I want to know how do I spell mm hmm? Oh, great question. <laughs> M M M. Three M's. Yeah, three M's. H M M. See, I would have H two M's. I believe that's what it is. Mm hmm. Okay. hmm. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> this is There's amazing. some great videos on, on that website as well. They just poke fun of themselves for naming it the most absurd name Ridiculous ever. Name. Yeah. Um, maybe does the panelists have any questions for each other? Yeah, I think I, I, often we go to events like this and we don't ask each other enough questions. Good point. <laughs> I'm an open <laughs> book. I, I have a question, maybe, maybe you know, that's good. Uh, so I was mentioning there's all these, these tools that make the, you know, creating all the analytics and creating the production and gelling it all together out there. One of the things that I've found to be very difficult, and today is no different, is I'm looking for a tool where the, you can stream from, mm -hmm. you can direct everyone to a web page, and with the RSVP process, you can have... Uh, people know if they'll be in person or if they'll be attending via streaming. Mm -hmm. And I can't find mm -hmm. anybody who's been allowing, and it seems like obvious right now, but so right. far like Eventbrite or some of the other things, we, it's like, if you're going to be there, it just says, yes, I'll be there, but we don't know where you'll be. Yeah. I don't know of a software, um, but 
I I do a lot of workarounds, especially when you're on a tight budget. So for all the nonprofits who are like working with those really small budgets, um, whatever wherever I could find a form. So usually for for a brunch, we've done like a almost like a two step process. We're looking to integrate it as well though. Um, but we would typically have them fill out uh, whether it's a Google form has been our go-to to kind of fill in that attendance information. Like, are you going to um, attend in person? Are you going to, you know, just get the link or do you just want the digital stuff on the back end? Um, so we would capture it that way with our spreadsheet and then like send the payment and mm -hmm. links and stuff after, or it would just redirect them to a page and the click their right um, payment option. But mm -hmm. we've done it typically as like a multi-step process because it still allows us like the plus with the google form as well in lieu of find that all-inclusive software it has some of those analytics up there for you already 50 percent set in person or whatever the case is mm. so there's some functionality to to play around with it so you can plan accordingly yeah great i don't know Anything if becky else? has any <laughs> no i'm i'm taking notes from you Liz. <laughs> <laughs> And I wish I had came right with a tech question, but I don't have enough. I don't have enough of the the details for um. This is besides you know my the owl pitch to get people That's to right. those owls. Well, I did have I did have another question here that um, and we can make this our our last one. Um, and this came up again in in some of our pre conversations. Um, that when you're when you're planning events, don't assume people's needs. Do what makes you comfortable. And this this came up because Liska had mentioned how um, she had color-coded name tags um, for people's comfort levels. So for the people that were there in person, you know, if you had a blue name tag, then you're doing an elbow bump. Mm -hmm. If you had a red one, you'll shake a hand and so on. And so, it, and, and, and I loved that. I loved that accessibility and I loved, I loved the organization. I love color coding, <laughs> but I, um, you know, I thought that, um, you know, that was, I, it was just a great lesson is to not assume mm -hmm. people's needs. Right. Yeah. There's definitely, cause it brings up like access issues. Um, I see a lot of events, um, locally and even not locally where they're, whether they're mandating a vaccine or whatever the case is, I understand, you know, maybe taking the test before, um, I do feel strong. Like if you're requiring someone to take a test, whatever that you should provide them or whatever the case is, but you're adding these extra layers of hardship for people where it's like, sure. we don't know their reasons for, for why whatever. they did yeah. or did not, or it, we don't know if the, they want to spend this 150 on the ticket. That's all they had. And now they have to go buy a test too. So right. mm -hmm. really try to remove like every single barrier. So for us, we definitely are on the stance of we're going to obviously look at what whatever the law says, um, but then we're going to work within that. And we've been trying to be as flexible and open as possible. So we're typically like, we're going to do the the regular stuff that's not costing anything. We're going to do the check. We're going to do that, like the integrity, the honor system of have you been exposed or whatever the case right. is. Mm -hmm. So capture all those things, but still give them that extra layer of the name tags. You know, how do you want to be greeted? So it removes that awkwardness when you're in person of, there's yeah. lots of dancing. <laughs> like, do you wanna <laughs> tango? Right. Um, right. So it removed a lot of that. I, yeah. I know it helped me when when I was there seeing people that I was familiar with. I may have hugged um, right. the year before, right, but, you but, kinda, but it's like, see you, girl. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. Um, so really trying to incorporate those those options. Like even when we did, we did have it hybrid that year where we had the whole recording. And some people opted last minute who paid for the in person ticket. It's like I'm just just send me the link. Yeah, just send me yeah, the link. yeah. It happens. Um, well, that is it for our time. I know we went a little over. We started a little late, but um, I want to thank everybody who came in person for being here today. We'll be milling about a little bit if you have any other questions. Um, and thank you, Becky, for thank shifting you. last minute and uh, dealing with our <laughs> audio and stuff. I appreciate it. <laughs>